out of Luke chapter 19 from 45 to 48. Remember that the title of the series for this entire week is Were You There? Were You There? And so every week I'm going to take you to a place and I'm going to try, I'm going to ask you to try and imagine yourself in that place. <clears throat> so Luke 19 from 45 says, And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple the chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. So come with me this evening to the temple. I thought I'd say to you, please um, find a space where you're not close to anybody else, but I don't think that's going to work. Mm -hmm. Come with me to the temple and, and perhaps just for a moment close your eyes and imagine yourself sitting somewhere on the temple grounds. We're in the court of the Gentiles. That is the place before we get to the brazen altar or the place where the animals are slaughtered. There's a hustle and a bustle on the temple grounds. There's a buzz of excitement. Where are you standing? Can you picture where you're standing? What do you see as you look around you? What do you smell? What do you hear? Are you perhaps hearing people shouting their wares to the public? Or the money changers calling out the exchange rate? How do you feel? Now imagine this. There's an eerie silence that settles over the temple grounds. And the man walks in. His stride is forceful. And he carries this air of authority around him. He walks up to the first table and he overturns it with one hand. And everything scatters. The silence on the temple grounds is deafening. And then there's a commotion. People shouting and running and, and this man just keeps on walking through the temple, temple grounds, overturning tables as he comes and people don't know what to do. The animals are running all over everywhere, the chickens are clucking, the sheep are bleating and people are scrambling to pick up their things. And then he speaks. How do you feel? How do you feel? Right. Would anybody like to just say how they're feeling? What are the emotions that, that are going through you right?
Ashamed. 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 Sorry. Same. Ashamed. Also a bit confused. A bit confused. Trying to work out what's going on. A little bit bewildered. Yeah. Surprised. Mm -hmm. Surprised. Surprised. Yes. This was a normal day. This is what they did. Anybody else? Uncertainty. Uncertain? Absolutely. Fear. Hold those things. Trepidation. Fear. Fear. Trepidation. Yeah, definitely. This story of Jesus and the money changes happens twice. Not just once. We read about the first account in John chapter 2, and then we read the second account of this in all four of the Gospels. And I just happened to have picked out the Gospel of Luke. This account happens towards the end of Jesus' earthly ministry when he goes to the temple. He gets upset by the marketplace that the temple has turned into. And then he overturns all those tables and he clears the temple and in some of the other gospels we read that he twines a whip and he cracks that whip. And we read about the righteous anger that Jesus displays at the temple. But there's so much we can learn from these events and from what Jesus was speaking out against and not making the same mistakes as those people did. When we examine the story of Jesus and the money changes, we can learn about righteous anger and how to respond to situations with righteous anger. We also learn that the root of evil in this story is the love of money. Oops, was I allowed to say that? Today we no longer have a temple in Jerusalem. There is no place for them to offer sacrifices. There hasn't been since 70 AD. But you know what? When I read through the New Testament and especially Paul's writings in Corinthians he says that we are temples we are temples of the Holy Spirit and it's important that we know how to treat this temple there are four accounts of the story of Jesus and the money changes in Matthew 21 in Mark 11 in Luke 19, which I read, and the fourth is in John chapter 2. And all these accounts, although they are written by four different authors, communicate the same story in a similar way. The story begins with Jesus entering into the temple and being upset with what was going on in the temple, and he turns, overturns the tables, and he drives out all those who were there in John chapter 2 it says in the temple courts he Jesus found people selling cattle and sheep and doves and others sitting at tables exchanging money so he made a whip of cords and drove them from the temple courts both sheep and cattle he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables to those who sold doves he said get these out of here Stop turning my father's house into a market. What upset Jesus? Why does he get so angry? Well, he gets angry at the fact that people were cheating. And they were cheating the poor. Remember that, that if you were poor and could not afford a sheep, you would come and offer a dove. All they did to the doves was turn their necks to kill them, but they were left whole where the sheep were slaughtered. 
And Jesus is angry at the fact that even the very poor could not afford to offer a dove. Why is he so angry about that? Well, he's angry about it because the temple was the place that was set aside by God for the worship of God and the presence of God. The presence of God. When Solomon built the, the first temple, which was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon in 586 BC, when Solomon dedicates the temple, he sees the Shekinah glory of God settle in that temple. We don't read that about the second temple, which we call Herod's temple. But what we do read about is the fact that people were so brazen that they would steal from the poor Open because these accounts are written by four different people we have four different perspectives on this in Matthew I read he said to them it is written my house shall be called a house of prayer but you make it a den of robbers in John I read Jesus, John quotes Jesus differently by saying, take these things away, do not make my father's house a house of trade. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He's speaking about his death and his resurrection. What is righteous anger? We're allowed to exercise righteous anger when we see people taking advantage of others. If we look at how the money changers acted and what they were doing, we realize that they were taking advantage of others. And Jesus says that they've turned the, the temple into a den of robbers in Mark chapter 11. This indicates to me that the money changers weren't just selling money, but they were cheating. Throughout the Bible, we can find verses and passages that will support this. And you only have to go and read the book of Amos to realize how much righteous indignation can be spread, can be said about people who cheat the poor. In Amos, he says, you use a plumb line. Plumb line is that line that the builders drop down to make sure that the building's going to be straight, but they let it hang at an angle. Or they use scales that are not evenly balanced. So they put on a scale that's going to be heavier than the goods that you've got and it will weigh the same. And they cheat. And this happens 600 years before Jesus clears out the temple and he says, you may not do this. And then I wonder what Jesus would say about us today. I wonder sometimes what he would do if he had to walk into the places where we do business. How much cheating actually happens? You know the fine print that we so seldom read? And then all of a sudden, when you're supposed to get what is rightfully yours, you don't get it? I don't think we're any better. When we read the Ten Commandments, we hear the prophets speak to us about how stealing is wrong. God says it in the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not steal. And yet we do. We steal intellectual property, that's so easy. 
so easy. We played your arms, so easy. <laughs> and it's so, so wrong. You see, the one thing I know about Jesus is he is not passive to sin. He punishes it. Only by grace, by the grace of God through his son dying on the cross, can we be forgiven of our sin. And that is what we remember as we go towards Friday this week. My friends, let's not fall into the trap of taking advantage of those around us. If we see others being taken advantage of, we need to speak out. The temple today, there is no physical temple. And Jesus says, Paul, through Paul, says to us that we are the temple. There are things in our lives that we allow to creep in that create the same havoc that was created on the temple grounds in that day. The problem was not only the cheating that the people were doing, but the mere fact that we go against the Ten Commandments. We go against the very thing that Jesus tells us not to do. We covet our neighbor's possessions, their assets, and then we steal them. The temple was the place where God's Spirit came down and His presence dwelt there, and the Ark of the Covenant was the visible presence of God in the temple. And you know what? This makes the situation so much worse for those who were cheating. Because God was actually there. God was watching it. Remember that God is omniscient and God is ever-present and God sees everything that we do. Why did Jesus need to clean, cleanse the temple? According to, to Jewish law, animal sacrifices and the shedding of blood was necessary to atone for sin. And the money changes popped up, and they were a regular sight in the temple. They were there all the time. They were there for the convenience of the people. But the fees that they added were just exorbitant. And they oppressed the poor. God never wanted people to pay for the atonement of their sins. Never. God still doesn't want us to pay for our, our atonement, our forgiveness. Why? Because sin cost God too much. The price God paid was too high. And so when Jesus cleanses the temple, we realize that there are four um, lessons that we can learn from this cleansing of the temple. And the first is we need to pray. We need to praise. And so often we just forget to do that. We forget because money becomes too important. How often do we pray? How often do we just spend time with the Lord on our own without any interruption? Some of us do it daily, some of us do it once a day, some of us do it throughout the day. And that is wonderful. But how often do you praise God? How often do you just 
let a song flow through your mind and just lift your hands in praise of God. You see, God has promised never to leave us or forsake us. He's promised us that everywhere where the sole of our foot shall tread, that land He will give us. He's promised us that He will always be our helper and He will always be there through our life's trials. And when we pray, He answers with wisdom and with peace. Sometimes we pray for things because we want it our way. But is that God's wisdom that we are praying for? You see, we no longer need to sacrifice animals. We no longer need to build an altar outside here so that we can then slaughter a beast and, and put it on the altar because Jesus was slaughtered for our sin. And His blood flowed freely down that cross. And that is the reason for us to praise Him. The second lesson that I learned from this is that people come before money. Not money before people. We live in a society where we chase money instead of chasing people and relationships. When we help the hurting, when we pray for those who need help, then we are earning far greater than any amount of money could ever make. And unfortunately, We've never got time because we're chasing them. And somehow we need to realize that people are way more important than men. Third lesson I learned from this is that the real temple is me and you. Please remember that Jesus is far greater than any building on this earth. And his agenda goes forward when believers walk in his way. When we praise him and when we thank him and reach out to our neighbors. When you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and came to, to salvation, He deposited the Holy Spirit within you. Hold on to that. Because that is the sacred trust between you and God. We need to separate ourselves from the way unbelievers live. We need to. Because unfortunately, it rubs off on us. And before we know where we are, we speak like them and we behave like them. Where God has called us to live differently. God has called us to live for the Lord. Jesus didn't like the corruption of the greedy money changers in his temple. He doesn't like it when we pollute our bodies with the ways of the world. Where everything goes. Self-care has become the buzzword of our generation. You just have to walk into any bookstore and realize that there are more self-help books on the shelves than what there are books about the Lord. And we put all the emphasis on us, on us, where God is saying, take the emphasis off you and put the emphasis on Him. We, we have to take care of ourselves. I'm, I'm, please, I'm not saying that. Don't get me wrong. We have to take care of ourselves. 
but we also have to take care of the places around us. You'd never walk into a beautiful cathedral and throw your food paper or your sweetie paper on the floor. On the floor. And in the same way, we need to protect our body, our mind, and our spirit. The fourth lesson that I learned from this is that there's something called righteous anger. And this is the last lesson that I see from this cleansing of the temple, is that God has righteous anger. He will only let things go down and dark for so long. My friends, we are living in what we call the period of grace at the moment. But the time of tribulation is coming. When God is going to punish sin. We won't be here to see it. If you've given your life to the Lord, you're going to be raptured with Him when Jesus comes again. And none of us know that date or time. But the tribulation we know. We know when that's going to happen. It's going to happen after the rapture. Because God's patience is starting to run out with us. God is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger and He's abounds in mercy. But there comes a time when we need to stop what we're doing. We need to stop. At this point in time, absolutely anything goes and we justify it. And then Jesus walks through and overturns those tables. And then we're going to scatter we're going to feel the trepidation. We're going to feel the uncertainty. Those feelings that we started off with are going to come back. Revelation 22, verses 20 to 21 says, He who is the faithful witness to all these things says, Yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's holy people. These are not my thoughts. These are thoughts that I've taken straight out of the scriptures. Because that is what's going to happen. Please let's not go through this holy week just pretending everything is fine. Just pretend. Because that's not what God wants us to do. God has come to reconcile us to Him. To make sure that we are filled with the Holy Spirit to overflow. It's an amazing gift. It's an absolutely amazing gift to, to feel the Holy Spirit just rise within you the way it rose within Capano two Sundays ago. And therefore, we've got to glorify God with everything that we are and everything that we have. Please don't make this temple a den for thieves. Because that's so easy to do. Bible is full of, of stories that teach us and help us to grow in our walk with Jesus. And this event is no exception. It's no exception that, that Jesus wants to come into our lives and take out those dirty thoughts, those evil thoughts, those evil deeds. Wants to overturn the table. I've always said if you're going to lie, you've got to be very clever. 
you've got to remember what you said. But when I walk in truth, I never ever have to remember. Because it's the truth. And I can live that. So we can take these unjust situations in the world around us today and respond to them with righteous indignation. Please don't keep quiet when you see something wrong. It happened to me today. A lady undercharged me. I was busy buying vegetables and, and fruit for the nursery school. And in my mind, I sort of worked it out, no, it should be around there. And when I got to the till, it wasn't. And I said to her, can we just do this again? Because I think, and she said, no, I'm right. I said, just humor me. And do you mind? I'll, I'll even do it on my calculator. And she called the manager and voided the whole transaction and added it up. And I had, she had bought me 30 rand to the till. And she just looked at me. It's such a tiny thing. It means nothing in the bigger scope of things. But you know what it means a lot to her? <clears throat> to know that they're honest people. And I'm not getting away with a quick buck. I'd rather pay the amount I need to pay. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we sit here, Perhaps it's time for you to, to just close your eyes again and ask Jesus to walk through your temple. And just to clear out those things that he doesn't want there tonight. Where are you staying? What do you see? What do you smell? What do you hear? How do you feel? Father, we come to you this evening because we want our temples clean. Lord, I stand before you naked and guilty as child. Lord, I feel ashamed that I allow the things of this world to pollute my mind, to take my mind off you and center it on things that you don't want me to center on. Lord, I hear the enticement of the evil one so often. God, I just say I'm sorry. Lord Jesus, please walk through my heart and my life. Stand next to my table and just say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen.